how do we define the Upper Paleolithic in the Indian subcontinent? Now, the cultures of terminal Pleistocene have been grouped as Upper Paleolithic and Epipaleolithic or Late Paleolithic, while those of the Holocene are classified as Mesolithic. But we shall see that recent dates are taking back the antiquity of these cultures even further. Now, what is terminal Pleistocene? Terminal Pleistocene is the time period between 18,000 years before present to 10,000 years before present. This is a time when throughout the world, globally, sea level was low. There is cold, arid environment and it is called Terminal Pleistocene because it was the last stage of Pleistocene before the Holocene. These cultures have been named after European nomenclatures. In the Indian context, we find that stratigraphically, wherever Upper Paleolithic sites have been found, obviously talking about excavated sites, they are seen to succeed the Middle Paleolithic and to precede the Mesolithic. In the European context, these cultural remains, tools basically, have been found with the remains of Homo sapiens sapiens. However, in the Indian context, we haven't, as I discussed before, there is very little fossil evidence and we haven't found these uh, cultural remains with any fossil remains of the Homo sapiens sapiens. Chronology, a date of 41,900 years before present has pushed back the antiquity of this culture. A few dates are also found between 27,000 to 25,000 years before present and this also has helped us to revise the chronology. Now what about the technology and regional distribution of this culture? When flakes are, um, are sort of um, coming close to what we are describing as blades. Now, how, what do they look like? Now, we will see it in the following slides. Now, these implements on flake blades are occurring infrequently in the Middle Paleolithic, but still they are making their presence felt during this time. But in the Upper Paleolithic industries, as defined by MLK Murthy in 1979, uh, they are characterized by flake blade, blade tool, and blade and burine elements. Although these industries comprise the flake element, they are distinguished by the development of blade tool technology. Many of these blade tools were used as composite tools, that is part of other tools, thus signaling a definite change in technology from preceding cultures. Now this is a distribution of the Upper Paleolithic sites. You see this very important site of Buddha Pushkar in Rajasthan. You see that there are a lot of sites in central India and also south of the Vindhyas. You see Eastern India represented in um, Orissa. Uh, you see the rivers Brahmani, Mahanadi and Shubarnarekha which is also uh, in partly uh, Bengal. These and um, of course what is now Jharkhand. And these are the various river valleys where Upper Paleolithic sites have been found. These industries, they have certain characteristics. The flake blade industries are characterized by relatively broad blades, which shows a crude stage of blade technology. Scrapers, points and borers, which are mainly made on flakes and flake blades, are the common types. The less common ones are blades, knives, burines and small choppers. They have been recorded from open air, secondary, fine spots in the river sections of Shubhanarekha and Shanjai. Now let me just explain what is meant by open air, secondary, fine spots. Usually we make a difference between primary and secondary sites in prehistory. Primary sites are the places which are basically the original sites of occurrence where people lived, the past populations lived. Secondary sites are places where many of these tools are found now and they are often brought there sometimes washed down by the river or washed by the colluvial deposits. So that is why they are called secondary. So they are not the original sites of human activity. 
so these that is why i'm calling these fine spots they at least give you an idea that where you can look for primary sites then they have been found from surface sites in the garo hills surface sites in koel valley palamon in stratigraphical context in thekulia etc now this this is a picture of upper paleolithic artifacts from maralpavi and i was just talking about the flake blade industries see here you can see some of these flake flake blades tools made on flakes and uh, these are mainly made in as i can see in chert and some other fine grained materials a very important site of maralpavi so this is what the flake blades the tools made on flakes look like which are found in upper paleolithic culture again we are seeing some scrapers and flakes which are designated as upper paleolithic and uh, in the first picture you are seeing these scrapers which are made on flakes and here you are finding some flakes as well as some blades which belong to upper paleolithic the blade tool industries consist of large small sized blades backed blade tools scrapers points awls and burings on flakes flake blades and blades now we also find a uh, regularization of the blade tool technology because basically now you can understand that there is a change from the middle paleolithic to upper paleolithic technology now we have a full fledged blade tool technology and we see that there is an occurrence of standardized blades standardized blades means blades of generally one size and shape and retouched tools now what are the various places from where these blade tool industries have been recovered from excavated as well as explored sites these are from kudap kudappa region from karnool from bijapur gulbur gulbarga from the nanjed river valley bhimetka from the upper ven ganga valley all in madhya pradesh from nevasa dhavalpuri and other sides in ahmed ahmednagar nanded pune districts maharashtra from the third desert from the belan and son river valleys from the damin area of rajmahal hills we have to remember that there is lot of regional variation in the blade tool industries these are some of the cores blade cores found from ajodhya hill region purulia place very close to our kolkata basically in west bengal now you see these various um, cores these were used to extract blades and uh, uh, these are found these cores are found in various stages of reduction which means perhaps some of these cores were of a larger size when they were first fashioned as such from nodules but gradually as more and more blades were taken out from the cores they became reduced these are some of the flakes found in these assemblage i discussed what an uh, assemblage is all about these flakes have been found from again the same region ayodhya hill region many of them occurring with these blade cores that i just showed you now these are the finished tools now finished tools are basically the end products okay so you have the backed blades you have points you have crescents or what are called lunettes you have uh, geometric tools i'll be talking about them when we look at the mesolithic these are composite tools what i'm showing you here are composite tools which are used mostly they are composite tools which are used as part of other tools okay they are not used burin is basically i'll be showing you pictures of burin burin is if you see the tip of this kind of a tool you will see that that is used for some kind of an engraving activity uh, in wood or something like that and it has a pointed tip pointed tip now what are the sites and fine spots renigunta nagarjun konda <clears throat> in several pockets in the karnool region kuddappa and prakasam region these are basically um, in andhra in maharashtra the central tapi basin at patne they are a distinct technological entity on the southeastern coast of india now these are some of the artifacts um, choppers 
1 and 1 is chopper, 2 to 7 are scrapers. Sometimes you can understand these um, tools far better in line drawings like this because there their features are highlighted. If you see the sides of these scrapers from 2 to 7, this is what uh, you, you can see the working edge. The working edge is the edge that is, pre that is prepared as such, uh, which is used for, you know, for here, for the scraper, for scraping activity that we can see in these tools from two to seven scrapers. And then we are having um, some retouched blades, okay? Now retouching I'll be explaining later. Basically what is happening is that you are blunting, you're making these small scalloping marks on one side of the, say, of a blade because you are going to attach it to perhaps an arrow or a spear right with adhesive so you are blunting that part and you get these scalloping marks on tools this is called retouching i'll be coming to that later here we find retouched blades one four and six are retouched blades that surface which is highlighted that is those are the scalloping marks then two three five seven are simple blades which have not been retouched now we find that there are, I mentioned some knives. Knives, we find uh, these are artifacts from Renigunta. One and two are backed knives. Again, backing has been done on one of the surface. And then we have three to 12 backed blade and bladelet industries. Bladelets are even smaller blades. Then 13, we have all. All you can see that it's, it's a sort of uh, roundish um, sort of thicker kind of um, tool made on a flake and where the tip is pointed meant for some kind of an engraving activity or such then you have uh, 14 as a unifacial point unifacial means only one face has been worked on then you have um, 15 as a tanked point if you see the but end it looks like a tank that is why it's called a tanked point and of course then you find a blade core now these all classifications are have been worked on in detail by archaeologists now these are the burins you can see that sometimes these burins which are made from um, blades these often have the tips there are often uh, more than one burin, uh, burin tip right and these tips are shown by these arrows that we are seeing this is uh, uh, this was done to give it a chisel like edge meant for engraving in say bone or wood so with the tools also we can get an idea of the uh, of the functions okay there is a special technique by by which these burines were made but i'm not going into such details right now what about the ecological context and value environment of the upper level cultures <clears throat> these sites or fine spots are dispersed in desert grassland in woodland savanna in scrub woodland in thorny thicket zones Several species of game or animals have been found from here. That is, the remains of these animals have been found from here, like Nilgai, Chinkara, Four Horned ant on Antelope, Sambar, Chital, Barking Deer, Wild Boar, etc. Remains of many of these species were found in late Pleistocene deposits and are closely associated with Upper Paleolithic occupations in Karnul Caves. Fossil evidence of many other species are also found. Now, although recent dates have pushed back the antiquity of these cultures beyond the terminal Pleistocene, some lithic industries placed in this time period have also been called Upper Paleolithic. What is the terminal Pleistocene? Again, as I just had mentioned before, intense glaciation in the high latitudes and extreme aridity and low sea levels throughout the world. In India, such evidence has been found from present-day arid as well as subhumid zones. In fact, we have found such evidence of terminal Pleistocene from a subhumid zone like uh, uh, northwestern Mid uh, Midnapur, where a multidisciplinary work was carried out in this river valley called the Tarafeni River Valley. 
Scholars have looked at human adaptation, often incorporating ethnographic studies on present-day hunter-gatherers. Now, obvious question again would be how do we how do we trace the continuity of hunting gathering tradition? We are not tracing the continuity. This is one thing that I would like all of you to remember. We are using ethnographic work as a kind of heuristic device, as a tool to gain insight into past adaptation patterns. Now, <clears throat> what are the recent trends of research? Now, the classificatory schemes that I mentioned above are basically based on technical studies of finished tools. All those pictures that I showed you are basically the end products of a reduction procedure. What is a reduction procedure? The entire manufacturing process of stone tools. It is difficult to assign separate cultural labels on the basis of morphological characteristics or stratigraphic contexts. This is what is coming out in recent research. They are also looking at the nature of raw material because they feel that is determining the nature of tool type rather than just the morphological characteristics and they feel that we have to look at the entire reduction procedure. We also have to remember that in Indian context the blade using tradition has a very wide time range. Cultural traditions overlap and this is seen particularly in blade technology. Therefore, Upper Paleolithic tradition cannot always be classified into neat categories. Like I mentioned that some Microlithic industries, they might be just put into Mesolithic culture and not in Upper Paleolithic culture. Okay? So this is something that we have to remember. Traditionally, the Mesolithic or the Microlith using cultures are assigned to the early and middle Holocene. In recent years, chronology in South Asia has been pushed back by a few early dates from Sri Lanka. That is about 34,000 years before present and 28,000 years before present. The most recent date of 35,000 years before present from Jwalapuram, Andhra Pradesh, in which the industry has been labelled as microlithic, has modified our understanding of the chronology. It would therefore be best to think of a longer time span for this culture. And when we are saying microlithic, we are meaning those small blades which have to be of certain dimension. Now, we find a huge number of Mesolithic sites in the Indian context. Uh, they are well preserved. Substantial evidence is available on subsistence, environment and technology. Because you see, with most of these sites are dating to Holocene. Holocene is the time when there is no longer any glaciation. Ta climate is becoming more, uh, uh, more adaptable, perhaps, to the human beings. Large number of habitation sites have been excavated. For the first time, human burials have been seen uh, from the Indian Mesolithic context. Then you find very, very beautiful rock paintings, for example, in Bhimbetka Adamgar, which reflects the aesthetic and other cultural aspects of the Mesolithic. So you get to have a lot of information on the Indian Mesolithic. The number and density of Mesolithic sites is also greater. Almost all the eco-zones and regions that I have mentioned so far were exploited, including the hilly tracts of Orissa and the region around Chitraput Falls in central India. Also, we see that now human populations were exploiting a greater variety of habitats and expanding into Ganga Valley. This is very interesting. On the shores of Oxpo Lakes at Sarainahar Rai, Damdama and Mahadaha, you are getting huge number of Mesolithic sites. And for the first time, human burials are seen from these sites. Incidentally, the question that you might ask is, where did they get the raw material from? You cannot expect to find the raw material, those stone, uh, raw material nodules from these Oxbow Lake surroundings, it is being surmised that they got this raw material from the Vindian region. So you can see the kind of distance these people travelled or that there were these, in, uh, you know, sort of networks, network mechanisms. Perhaps, I don't know whether we can think of a prehistoric exchange system. Then we find evidence of Mesolithic culture in the Damodar Valley, in the hilly tracts of Gujarat and the sand dunes of Langanaj. Sand dune sites like Bagor and Tilwara in Rajasthan have been very well researched, uh, excavated by Vian Mishra. Uh, from the cave shelters of central India like Adamgar and Bhimbetka, then from the coastal sand dune sites which are called terry sites near the tip of the peninsula on the east coast. So you can see the wide variety of habitats that we are coming across during this time. Many of the Mesolithic sites bear evidence of antecedent stages of food production. 
Now this is the distribution of mesolithic sites. The blade industries and their techniques of production. We are finding highly developed blade and blade lead tool technology. You saw the beginnings in Upper Paleolithic and now you see a refinement of this technology. Overall, tool types of this period are parallel sided blades and blade lids, backed blades, pen knives, lunettes, obliquely blunted blades, triangles, trapezes, which are called geometric uh, microliths, points, scrapers, and occasional choppers. We are also finding evidence of the use of bone and antler tune, uh, tools, raw material, basically milky quartz, fine grained quartzite, chert, and chalston. Most of these were used as composite tools. How? As I mentioned, perhaps as tips and barbs of spear, spearheads, arrowheads. So they were being used in relation to other tools, not singly. And that is uh, what is meant by composite tools. And these were now, from the nature of these tools, you can make out that they were now hunting smaller animals. And from that also, you can make out that the environment was changing. Where would these smaller animals really uh, be found? You know, in grassland, and grazing area. Now, how do I, as I mentioned before, how do we describe a blade? A blade may be described as a flake whose length is at least equal to twice its width. Blades are removed by any of the three principal techniques. By direct percussion, using a hammer of stone, antler, wood or metal. By indirect percussion, or by pressure. What is direct percussion? That is the oldest technique which appears sporadically in the European Azilian. In recent years, hard hammers were used to make long obsidian blades, not from the Indian subcontinent. You are not getting obsidian in India. What is indirect percussion? In other cases, after a rough surface is made on the core, probably with the help of this direct percussion method, a small platform is prepared at one end. Against this is placed a punch and a tap is given by a mallet. Irregularities are removed by light tapping blows. You are making the platform, just remember. Since all the flakes are removed in the same direction, a fluting appearance results. The entire circumference of the core is just prepared and made ready for the removal of plates. See, you see, in the, this is a sort of compressed picture that we are finding. The nodule is held for preliminary trimming where this person is using the hard hammer percussion method. And the next thing that is the blade, now there are a lot of these stages coming in between the nodule and the blade core in this form. This is, as I said, this is a more compressed picture. So what is happening after you are preparing the platform, then each blow is struck above an intersection of two earlier negative flake scars those flake scars were left by the indirect percussion method. The main thing was to prepare the ridge and the ridge formed by their intersection will form a central keel on the blade when it is knocked off. You will see the central line that ridge appearing on the blade after it is taken off from the core. Now an indirect percussion blade is removed from the core which is following the ridge left by previous removals. Once you are taking off these blades by the direct percussion method and the intention being leaving a ridge, the next stage is maybe after two three stages you are trying to take out the blade, actual blade by the indirect percussion method that I just mentioned. There is no evidence of indirect percussion using a punch before the Mesolithic period. Now this can be true for the European Mesolithic, but the same cannot be said about the Indian Mesolithic. Possibly this method existed before. Because here, what is a very typical feature of the Indian subcontinent, especially this blade using tradition, you have a continuity of blade using tradition. Starting from the earliest date that we now have, say about 41,900 before present from a site uh, Meta Kheri in Narmada Valley. So from there till you know till even um, the recent times you see that there is a tradition of making blades. The characteristics of these blade products that is I'm talking about the Mesolithic are 
uh, Indian mesolithic are intermediate between indirect percussion and pressure flaking and sometimes difficult to distinguish between the two. Now what is pressure flaking? Here blades are removed by pressure, although the core is often shaped out using other techniques. Small platforms were made along the edge of the core. In some cases, the core was further prepared by making a ridge on it by alternate flaking. Then pressure is applied. In indirect percussion, you saw that there was a punch and on which there were you know, uh, some tapping blows were made. But in pressure, you are just applying pressure with the chisel or something like that. And there, the sitting posture or the standing posture of the maker is very important. The point which applies the pressure can be made of tusk or antler, thus this technique requires more equipment and of course it requires a greater uh, specialization. In some prehistoric specimens signs of heating are also evident and this requires very fine grained raw material and leads to maximum precision. Now what is retouching which I just briefly touched upon? Excepting the very early tools, almost all tools of subsequent periods show that after the flake was removed from the core, the edges of the flake or the core itself have been marked by further chipping, sometimes partial or sometimes all around. This is what is called retouching. Many of the blade tools were retouched and this technique was perfected during the Upper Paleolithic and the Mesolithic period. A number of special techniques included among retouching were also used in tool manufacture. This is called the microburine blow technique and the burine blow technique. These geometric microliths which are in the shape of isosceles triangle or scalene triangle, they have been named as such by archaeologists. They are made by this uh, microburine technique. Now this is the microburine technique that I just mentioned. You can see the two triangles coming off um, you know where the arrows you can see at the tip of the blades so there you can see two detached geometric microliths coming out now it is with this i end my discussion on the upper Paleolithic and mesolithic cultures as you realize it's a very very vast subject what i just tried to do was give you a basic outline of these cultures